So welcome everybody. Um, again, I'm Matt Molina. I'm the director and founder of NYC H2O. We're super excited that everyone can join us tonight for a talk about the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Lana Rinsler, Laura Dirks, the owner and founder of Interboro Spirits and Ales, and Bill Hoagland, the historian who wrote the book about the Whiskey Rebellion and, and will be speaking tonight. So um, for those of you who are new to H2O, um, just a, a, a brief word about it. We are a, a nonprofit based in New York City and we primarily focus on environmental education and um, uh, do a lot of field trips to, uh, to parks and reservoirs and, 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 and beaches for kids and, and for family audiences and, and um, uh, adults too. And um, along with that, we do a lot of stewardship work in these parks all around the city in the five boroughs. Um, and especially at the Ridgewood Reservoir, which is what led us to the, the Whiskey Rebellion. And I'll, I'll explain how uh, in a minute. Uh, I just uh, wanna go over uh, just some brief logistics to help the, the program run smoothly. Uh, we welcome questions. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end of the talk. The talk will last about 45 minutes. Um, and you know, as questions come up, feel free um, to ask them in the chat. We'll monitor them and we'll, we'll get to them um, and as, or as many of them as we can in, in the chat. So, um, so thanks for that. Um, the lineup tonight will be, I'll introduce Laura Dirks and Laura will introduce Bill. Um, so uh, I'll start with introducing Laura. Laura Dirks is the owner and co-founder of Interboro Spirits and Ales in Bushwick, Brooklyn. I met Laura when she graciously invited us for a tour of Interboro Spirits and Ales um, and a beer tasting at the conclusion of one of our Bushwick Brewery tours. Uh, and, and we'll be starting those up uh, again um, in a month or so. So we invite you to join us for those. Um, Bushwick, uh, I should note, was the brewing capital um, of the United States from the late 19th century all the way through prohibition. Um, and the water that was used to make the beer came from the Ridgewood Reservoir. So that's what brought us to, to Laura. And um, Laura gave um, a really fascinating tour of her facility. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. I, um, uh, I, I invite everybody to, to encourage everyone to, to visit um, for the you know, terrific um, beers and, and spirits that, that they make, um, but also to, you know, to see um, how it all works. They, they do all the, the processing there. Um, and you know, she gave these engaging explanations of the distilling process and, and how they made everything, um, but also the history um, and including the Whiskey Rebellion, which I had never heard of before. And so, so here we are. Um, um, we're, uh, we're very uh, fortunate and, and uh, super appreciative. Laura offered us um, a pair of tickets to an upcoming whiskey tasting um, at Interboro, and we're going to have a silent auction of those uh, after the, um, the talk, and we'll do it through email, so um, not to take away the, any of the focus of tonight's talk. So, so thank you very much to Laura for her, her, her generosity, um, and um, we'll send you an email with, with how to participate in, in that auction for the whiskey tasting, um, and that'll take place uh, at uh, into borough and there are a few dates coming up. Um, so uh, uh, if you bid, you, you will definitely have an opportunity to, um, uh, to follow through on it. Um, I, I also recently learned from Laura that she majored in geophysics in college, um, which accounts for her detailed explanation of the distilling process, which is obviously a, a scientific uh, thing, and that she wanted to be an astronaut and that her dad was a history buff. So please join me in welcoming Laura Dirks. Thanks, Matt. And uh, while my astronaut aspirations might have not come to fruition, being an owner of a brewery and distillery is not a not too bad of a second, you know, second thing to land. 
Um, and then it lets me give these kinds of things and talk about things like the Whiskey Rebellion, which are super, super interesting, and super interesting parts of our history. Uh, you know, most times when we look back at these kinds of things, these kinds of historical events, we tend to simplify them, right? Like they become, you know, they were complex events, but they become simple story arcs. People's motives become straightforward, like hero's journeys. And everybody in there becomes like these flat caricatures of who they actually were. But just like now, it's much more complicated than that. Um, when we opened Innerboro in 2016, the Whiskey Rebellion became this thing that I put in our tours while I talked about what we did and the history behind it, like, like Matt was saying. And it was like a little flair, you know, a little color to what I could talk about while I talked to everybody about our products. Um, the story I tell is like a fun version, right? It's like, there are good guys, the distillers and they're bad guys, the, you know, the government folks. Um, there's tar and feathers and booze and bullets and lots of stuff going on at that time in our history. Um, but, you know, and then I sort of talk a little bit about how distillers are, were out there and we ended up paying for the Revolutionary War. And in fact, we've paid for a lot of wars along the way. Um, and you know, wrap up with this lesson of the fact that the folks we call our founders solidified our nation of states um, under a central federal system through this power of taxation. Um, you know, after that, I kind of, we don't talk about it anymore. We just drink all the tax beer and spirits and get to taste everything. And uh, sometimes I end up with people who want to talk a little bit more because my version of the story, unlike the musical Hamilton, paints Alexander Hamilton kind of on the wrong side of history and not really where he's in the musical. Um, but of course, both my version and the version in Hamilton are, are much simpler versions than what actually happened uh, and in the events of the time. Um, Bill's book uh, on the rebellion gives us a lot more of the nuance, the complex real people uh, and their motivations in that pivotal time of history. Um, the Shroud of Time, you know, comes into play. We don't actually know all the truth and um, it'll be speculation. There's not always clear heroes like we'd like to see. Um, the reality being there are no good guys or bad guys in, in real life. And they're just people who are working on, you know, working through their ideas and the interactions of everybody's different agendas and just plain luck of what happens. Um, I'm really excited to hear Bill talk about uh, the beginnings of our country and all this history of taxation and, you know, of course, the history of these excise taxes that us good distillers still pay, you know, so uh, Bill, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to do this. Thanks for letting me introduce you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, it's, it is actually a pretty rip snorting story with all kinds of uh, exciting exciting elements, exciting action. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm into that. That's actually what I, what I'm, what I do. I'm, I'm going to give you some of the complexity that, that Laura was talking about, but um, uh, there's a, there's a lot of sort of slam bang stuff that happens in this story. And it's one reason I was attracted to it as well. Um, plus the, you know, it's called the whiskey rebellion. I mean, when I first heard about it, I was like, well, there's whiskey and there's rebellion. This has to be an interesting story. And I turned out to be a lot more interesting than, than I even thought. Um, I can feel you all out there. Thank you for coming. It's kind of new to me to, I'm, I'm no longer scared to talk to large groups, um, but I've never talked to large groups when they're not in a group before. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's, I can see the waiting room on the Zoom, people are coming in. It's kind of cool. It's a different kind of vibe for me. Um, so it's good to know you're there. Otherwise, this would be a dude sitting in a room talking to a screen about the Whiskey Rebellion. That would be perhaps a little depressing. Um, so thanks for coming out, I could say, I, used to, I usually say, but thanks for being here. I say, I guess what I really mean. Um, yeah, so the Whiskey Rebellion. Um, Laura knows a fair amount about the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, Matt had said he hadn't, didn't know about it. I think if you do know a lot about the Whiskey Rebellion and you're here, I'm gonna apologize in advance because I'm gonna do kind of Whiskey Rebellion 101 in a way, um, because I think there's a good chance that the majority of the people here are gonna be more in Matt's position of not really knowing too much about it at first before he heard about it from Laura. 
Um, or maybe you've heard about it, you know, you've seen it maybe as a sidebar in a, in a history textbook or something like that, like a, a little incident that occurred, um, sort of a weird little breakout moment uh, as a sort of on the inevitable path to nationhood or to establishing US sovereignty everywhere where England had conceded, uh, had conceded land. And you, if, if that's how you think of it, uh, you're kind of in, you're on solid ground because that's pretty much how it's been largely considered in the, in the literature and in, in books you might read about some of the major players, uh, some of the major founders who were involved. Um, you wouldn't really get the idea that it was super important, just kind of an interesting little dust up sidebar, which is weird because to, to George Washington, uh, for example, but it's not just an example, to George Washington, who might really have known, uh, he considered it really one of the most important things, maybe the most important thing that occurred during his presidency. Um, and so it's, it gets a little weird and interesting to wonder why don't we think of it that way? And I think some of the reasons we don't really look at it may come out uh, in my talk, but we can talk about that later, possibly. Anyway, so yeah, let's start at the end um, and then I'll fill you in on how things got to where they got to. In 1794, in the fall of 1794, President Washington, in his second term, very sick of being president by now, um, led, raised uh, a troop strength of about 12,000 men, um, cannon, horses, all the stuff that goes into an army. Uh, cannon, horses, feed, clothing, supply, the whole deal, wagons the whole cumbersome deal. And a uh, 12,000 or so is, is well more than the number he was commanding, for example, in the Battle of Yorktown to defeat the British and effectively uh, achieve victory in the War of Independence. And he personally led this troop. This is the President of the United States as Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces, um, actually commanding troops in the field. That's not something we see a lot of putting it very mildly. I mean, is, it may be the only real example. Um, maybe, maybe James Madison kind of came out of, out of Washington uh, during the War of 1812 and sort of tried to sort of be a commanding presence, but I don't think it, was, it worked out well if he did. In any way, it's not something we expect to see. Um, and it wasn't clear that we would have expected necessarily to see it in 1794. So yeah, that's a big deal. That's a large number of troops. And and the, he led them out of the East um, against an enemy uh, in a military fashion. And the enemy that he was leading these troops against was American people, was US citizens, who, were in, who had begun in a state of protest and were now in a state of uprising, a state of insurgency, a state of rebellion against federal authority. So, that seems like a pretty big deal. It was a big deal to him, and he wasn't the only person it was a big deal to. And yet, we don't really tend to look closely at what that was all about. I wrote a book about it, so I see the whole world as revolving around the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, you know, that's just, you gotta take some of what I say with a grain of salt when I talk about importance to a degree, because every writer has a thesis, and then they also have the other thesis, which is that what they're writing about is super important and everyone should know about it. Like my thesis is partly like everyone should read my book. Um, so I'll just, you can decide how important you think it is. Um, but Washington did, I'm not alone in thinking it was. And so what, why on earth would the president of the United States raise a force that big and all that goes into that in the 18th century and lead it against American citizens? And why whiskey? What was whiskey about the Whiskey Rebellion? Um, so I'm gonna tell you the answer to those, those questions uh, in a somewhat superficial manner. The book, of course, I can go into a lot more detail, um, but I've only got a little bit of this time here. So I'm gonna give you kind of the broad stroke drama of how that came about. Um, so let's back up now, let's back up whiskey. Let's think about whiskey and let's think about the whiskey tax, which was, I mean, Laura's just described it pretty well. Um, the first, it was the first federal tax ever passed in the United States 
on a domestic product. That is not an import tax, not a tax on wines, imported wines and, and rum and so forth, but a tax on a product made in the United States. The federal government was new. Um, so it's not that surprising that it passed, it passed the first federal tax on a domestic product. Um, but the context in which it did so takes whiskey and connects it in a way that's somewhat counterintuitive um, to high finance, to, to government finance and to private finance. So the author of this whiskey tax, this tax on distilled spirits distilled within the United States, as they were called in the law, the author of this tax was Alexander Hamilton. You may have heard of him, as Laura just mentioned. Uh, he's, he's, being, he's, he's, pretty, he's pretty famous right now. Uh, he wasn't when I first started looking into the whiskey tax and the whiskey rebellion, but he is now. And um, this, what I'm about to describe in terms of what he was doing and why there was such a tax and then what he did about it and what people didn't like about it and what some people did like about it does cast him in a light that's somewhat different from the light in which he's cast, but not only in the musical, which is one thing, but also in the biography on which the musical is based, the very well-regarded, very big selling uh, biography of Hamilton by Ron Chernow. Um, Chernow spends very little time on the Whiskey Rebellion as indeed most biographers have spent, of, of Washington as well, have spent very little time on it. Um, so there are things about, what I'm about to say about Hamilton that will bring out other sides of his, of his character and of his, and not, not so much of his character, but really of his, his goals for the country, his goals for the country. It might seem strange that a tax on whiskey would be so paramount, so critical to the authorship of like the economic nationhood of the United States at its very inception, because that's a big, big goal and a big tax. Um, so, well, how did that work? Now, when we think about Hamilton, we probably think, some people think about uh, the debt, the debt. He was the sort of the, he was the, he, he, got a, he got the war debt under control. Some of, some of you know about Hamilton as like the author of uh, the funding plan, it's called, and funding and assumption. These are terms that we associate with Hamilton. He put the nation on a, on a solid footing for having good credit, which was critically important to having a nation. Um, and all of that is true. It's just that we don't always look uh, super closely at what that literally means and what it meant to him. He is the, he is the founder of the, of the economic nation, of the economic United States. And to Hamilton, that's like redundant. Like being the founder of, an econo of the economic nation is being the founder of the nation. I mean, the way he would look at it, and he wasn't alone in this, um, you know, what is a nation really? but a con some kind of concentration of economic power combined with and kind of integrated with some kind of concentration of military force. That's certainly a way he would have looked at it. So he's, his ego was, was vast and super effective. Um, and he would have seen what he was doing as actually founding the nation itself. At some point, you know, you've got to have these concentrations of power or you're not going to have nation. The way he looked at it, the relationship of the debt, I am gonna to get to whiskey, but it, this is the thing, you've gotta like do these kind of backtracks to kind of go to very big issues about the founding to get to what this whiskey tax was about and why then it would become so intense for people that they would enter a state of insurrection over it, leading to this gigantic force by Washington. So yeah, we're doing like, we're kind of going back and then we're going back. So. Um, what, what was this debt that Hamilton is famous for having dealt with? This was a debt that, this was the domestic part in particular of the debt that paid for the Revolutionary War. The, 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 the Continental Congress had had to borrow. And what that means is they issued bonds. Um, and there's a lot of complexity to this I'm gonna gloss over, but these bonds were held by, I mean, not just by and large, really exclusively by the end of the war, these bonds, this government debt, this debt to bondholders was held, owned by, oh, you know, you might just say the 1% if you want to keep, keep it real shorthanded. I mean, these are the people who had the money to lend, the cash 
This would be the merchant class and some of the really big landlord class. Um, they, they had the money to lend and to invest in the war. And they were going to get a nice 6% interest return, annual interest return on that. Um, no tax on that, by the way, because, you know, whoever heard back then of a tax on interest income. Um, so that's pretty good. You know, the United States has to win the war. That has to happen. And that didn't look likely. Um, and you have to have a, and, and you have to have some organization that's committed to actually funding that debt. Now, I'm not going to say paying it off. I'm going to say paying the interest, creating the wealth, growing money from money. Because, of course, in the end, that debt was to be paid down. But Hamilton's vision, which he got from his mentor, Robert Morris, who had been the superintendent of finance during, during the revolution. And again, no problem if you haven't heard of Robert Morris, because how would you have heard of him? Is he even a character in the musical? Is he, he's only barely mentioned in the biography on which the musical is based. Um, and yet, this was Hamilton's only mentor in the founding of the economic nation and himself quite a visionary, quite a visionary of high finance. Well, it was their idea that um, the way you were gonna unify the country after the war where all these 13 different states were really kind of wanting to go their own way and so forth. You're gonna unify the country by empowering the interstate lending class that had created that debt, had bought that debt essentially. And by unifying them as a class, this is the most upscale people in the country, and making the federal government the payer of that debt and the funder of that debt, the, 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 the institution that could pay the 6%, um, you would create a class who's a, a, very high, a very high powered class of people, a very small class of people, a very rich class of people, whose interests, like in all senses, the actual interest on their debt and also their fundamental interests as, as economic actors would be yoked to the federal government. And from this, we would form a nation because there was a huge pushback against forming a nation at all, a national government at all. Um, the Continental Congress had no power to pass laws that obligated people throughout the states. It could pass resolutions of what the states had to do. So this was a, this was a radical new idea to actually create a national government. And Hamilton and Morris's idea was to do it by creating this class of rich investors, forming as a, them as an interstate class and making sure they felt comfortable that they were gonna get paid 6% interest on their war debt. And yes, as that debt got paid down, you would also want to offer them other opportunities to make similar kinds of money by investing in government, in big public private projects like canals and other infrastructure and settlement of what they called the unpopulated Western forests, which were not unpopulated at all, but were held by other nations, indigenous nations. And all of the major things that really did occur and were going to occur uh, as the United States became what they made no bones about calling, I mean, Hamilton, Morris, and others, an empire. They were looking to create an empire. And you do that by on the British model of concentrating wealth through a big central bank, which is both a private bank and has a government charter, and by funding a big debt. So that when you think about the way Hamilton's usually presented, and you think about the fact that the idea was, oh, they ran up way too much debt during the war. And then he comes in as secretary treasury, secretary of the treasury, first one ever. And he's confronted with this problem. Oh, the debt, we have to find a way to pay off the debt. This is like literally the opposite of what Hamilton saw in the debt. The whole effort in the 1780s uh, as the war sort of wound down had been to protect and even build the debt because the whole idea is the bigger the debt to this small group of rich people. The more, the more those people are going to want to get paid, and the more urgently that's going to happen, that you'll have this very urgent, worried investing class, the more you're going to have to give Congress or something, maybe we'll call it the United States of America as a national government, the power to pass laws that obligate people throughout the states in order to raise the money through taxation, not through the states, but by taxing Amer an American product or two or three or four. Hamilton started with one, um, but that was the vision. And the vision was not that, that a public debt is a bad thing. The idea was that a public debt is just gonna unlock all of this dynamic, creative, financial potential in this nation. 
and that sooner or later we would have actual manufacturing and organize, you know, get, get labor organized in factories and really compete in a way with, with the British Empire. This was a very, very vaunting, vaulting ambition. Um, kind of amazing to even be able to have that vision and then what it would take to bring about. And it was quite controversial. But having formed the nation um, and having made efforts to have the Constitution of the United States cover off on some of these issues and give the, the central government, the federal government, now the national government, the power to tax in this way and to prevent the states from being able to do certain things regarding paying off debts, um, they achieved what they wanted, which was a power to a power to really have what Hamilton and Morris and Washington and others thought of as a government that could really become an empire, uh, become a kind of commercial empire. So Hamilton is, should be known for funding the debt, not for paying it off, although paying it down, of course, is part of that. But let's not confuse paying our credit card, a minimum annual amount on our credit card with paying off our credit card. Paying the interest to the investors, that's funding the debt assuming in the debt, in the national debt, all of the state's debts for the war, huge, much more money, swelling the debt to massive proportions by making the federal government, in a sense, the single payer of debt, of interest. And people say funding and assumption, blah, blah, blah. That's what he did. Yeah, but he did it. There was a third leg to that, to that thing. And it was called the revenue. You have to have revenue to do that, which means you have to have tax law. And then you have to have something to tax. Hamilton taxed whiskey, domestic whiskey. He did not come up at first with a whole big slate of taxes. He laid a tax on uh, whiskey produced in the United States. Uh, Laura just used the term an excise tax. It's a tax on a, on a product. It's not a tax on somebody's income. It's not a land tax. It's a tax on a product. It's collected by a powerful collection organization with police powers and powers to summons offenders, et cetera. Um, it's collected at the point of production. So it's collected in cash at the point of production. Uh, back then, the only real money, 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 was gold and silver. Um, and so this was how he wrote, this is how he wrote the law. Um, and it would, and, and he wrote a law to collect this tax on whiskey that had certain very, very, what we would call today, regressive features. It hit the poorer people who could least afford it harder, and it privileged the better off, bigger people who could afford it better. So I'm gonna talk about that for a minute, because that's a key piece of this. And again, it's not something you're gonna hear about uh, too often, even in a lot of books that talk about Hamilton's accomplishments. Um, but before I talk about how that worked to penalize the small artisanal distiller and privilege the bigger, more industrial commercial distiller, let's talk about whiskey for a second. Um, and let's talk about whiskey and the people and whiskey especially and what was known at the time as the West, the Western part of the United States, which was not the West we think of now. We think of the Rockies the plains and so forth. We're talking about um, a West that was really focused around the headwaters of the Ohio River, the gateway to the farther West, the Ohio River, um, around the village of Pittsburgh, which was a village there and then, um, and was very, very remote from Philadelphia. So it's hard for us to imaginatively go to a place where like the far West, the wild West was Western Pennsylvania, but it was at the time. Um, and Whiskey had a particular relationship to that West. And that West had a particular relationship to movements within the country that were pretty anti-Hamiltonian, pretty against concentrating wealth uh, in this way, had a much more egalitarian idea about how, how wealth should be handled and how American money and how labor should be handled too. So let's talk about whiskey in the West. Um, there were people in the West distilling whiskey in a seasonal, artisanal way. Um, these were poor farmers and small farmers, small landowners, operating at a very 
they felt very strongly that the Eastern establishments represented by a guy like Hamilton uh, had abandoned them. This is before the revolution even. They were pretty much against a lot of what was coming out of the Eastern capitals. They felt abandoned and neglected by those governments, those colonial governments run by their fellow Americans. Um, and they and they felt they were being left out of access, fair, equal access to, to economic development, to access to credit, um, and so forth. So there'd been this tension already, this tension between the more sort of down at heels, but more egalitarian West, uh, West of the Alleghenies, and, at the, and even West, just even, even at the Alleghenies, and even just West of, say, the, I don't know, the, the Blue Ridge or whatever. Um, and, and so the tension between those people who are poor and, and egalita more egalitarian and the Eastern money interests that Hamilton was so connected to and believed was, and he believed was the future of the country because what is a nation but getting those interests consolidated um, and getting labor you know, lined up and organized in factories, you know, not artisanal, uh, not, not small farmers. You know, let's, let's, let's build this into something, that's Hamilton. Well, the small farmers, they wanted to build stuff too. Uh, we can tend to romanticize them as sort of maybe kind of pastoral people who want to live in a communal world or something. Not necessarily by any means. I mean, they wanted to build economically too, but they wanted to build their own farms and their own art art artisanal practices and so forth. They didn't want to do it his way. So there's this tension already. Um, and by coincidence or not by coincidence, uh, probably not some way, the best whiskey that was known throughout America and actually all the way down to Mississippi and, and New Orleans even, the best whiskey was known to come from this area around the headwaters of the Ohio, from these, largely from these artisanal distillers there. It was known by, almost by brand as Monongahela Rye. That's one of the rivers that forms the Ohio River. The Allegheny is the other one. Um, and it was prized among people who drank whiskey and it was, since these farmers were poor, it was like their only cash crop. They, they had to do a lot of subsistence stuff and a lot of barter and stuff. They felt they were reduced to these kind of primitive forms of economics by the neglect of the establishments and the oppression of the money interests. But they could make money, cash money on whiskey. And you could take, now, okay, so what kind of whiskey was this? Because we, uh, you know, some people are probably here out of an interest in whiskey and know a lot more about whiskey than I do. I know Laura does. Um, but this was not, um, this was not bourbon. Uh, and it wasn't really a modern, the kind of whiskey most people drink nowadays at all. Uh, these, these guys distilled rye. Uh, and so it was a rye whiskey and rye's had a big comeback actually. Like around the time I started writing this book, uh, it started to have a comeback. And I got to have a really good time in the research process for that book. Uh, because I felt it was incumbent upon me to do a certain amount of um, tasting the product and experimenting. And, and actually what, what they would have, I mean, the closest thing we would get to what they were making probably, and at maybe in the Q&A, we can talk about this some more because I don't even know if this is totally true, but I think it is, would be kind of a, a, a very clear, very strong, very unaged, um, maybe somewhat uncomplicated, um, but apparently pretty appealing. Uh, uh, shot so that uh, what we would call maybe now like a moonshine type of thing or a white dog or something like that where you can see through it it's super powerful and it, those things have their own complexity and I, I think the really good distillers really knew how to, what they were doing they were, they were they were you know they were artisans they were artists they could control the you know what was coming out when and uh, they could they could mix and match and, and they and they they were good at it and they were successful at it because it was the only way some of these poor farmers could get any cash. And they, and they distilled um, seasonal, basically. So um, this is what the, here's where the conflict is, okay? Without going into every detail about how that worked, you've got Hamilton's finance plan, which is about framing up a, uh, a nation based on empowering and unlocking the power of elites. Um, and you've got a bunch of people who are struggling to get by, but are very committed to having their to having their product get them the cash they needed. Now, I've said it was a regressive tax because Hamilton very deliberately built into the mechanism of the tax structure 
ways in which it was going to be very, very hard for the smaller distiller to, to compete and made it much, much easier for the, uh, for the big distiller. And he added to that, and I, I'm not going to go into all the details. It had to do with still capacity and other, other ideas, but he privileged the innovative, more commercial distiller. Added to that, he came up with ways of kind of creating these cartel almost kind of situations in which, um, you know, like the, the army, there was, a, there was an army developing uh, in the West to go conquer that Indian land. Um, the army was one of the major customers for, for whiskey. Um, and so he, uh, he, he really kind of locked it all up. He got the army supply under the treasury department. He, he had people in, in uh, buying in the quartermaster's offices, buying the stuff from their relatives who were commercial distillers. He built it every which way to cut out the small producer. So why would he do that would be kind of the question. And the funny thing is when you think about it now, like now it seems like something, oh, it'd be like a dirty little secret. Like there's this secret conspiracy going on in government to drive out small players and, and privilege the big players. He didn't make any bones about this. I mean, his whole idea was to industrialize the country and get it operating on a kind of very efficient scale. And he felt that was gonna be done by the kinds of things he built into the tax. We're gonna get rid of all this small occasional distilling. These people should probably all be working on bigger commercial farms anyway, or in factories. You know, this was the, this was the industrial vision of the United States. It's, it, was, it was a pretty big deal. Well, I think as we, the, the tax passed, and I think we can now see how conflict, it passed in 1791. And I think we can now see how conflicts could arise uh, that would lead to what I've just talked about, which was the kind of the end of the story, which is Washington raising these, raising these troops. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to give you in the time we have the blow by blow. If you're interested, of course, I've written a book about it, which you can read, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little sense of what the vibe was like, and then we'll come back to the end of the story where uh, Washington and, and, and actually Hamilton came down pretty hard on these people. But one of the dynamics, uh, which I'm not gonna review in detail now, is that both sides in this conflict, the government side and the, and the small distillers who are becoming rebels, they both escalated. This is another odd fact about, about the government side of this. Um, Hamilton escalated and the people who became rebels escalated. They started out by protesting and writing petitions. Then they started tarring and feathering tax collectors, Hamilton's you know, inside crony type people who were out there trying to collect. They started you know, trashing people's houses if they were tax collectors. They, then they started uh, punishing people who were uh, actually paying the tax. So you still get shot up or you get a visit from some scary guys. So this is pretty intense. Um, you know, it's, 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 it can be easy to romanticize the, uh, the whiskey rebels because they were rebelling and all that kind of stuff. And they, you know, and they were getting a raw deal. But on the other hand, you know, this is very scary mob stuff. And by the time it got really intense, they had taken over basically through, they had sort of replicated the militia system. And basically they were in charge of five counties of Western Pennsylvania, and they were not letting people pay the tax and they were expelling tax collectors. So, okay, you'd think, well then Hamilton and Washington be like, okay, how do we deal with this? We don't want this to come to some sort of head where we're using military forces or whatever, but no, actually quite the reverse. On Hamilton's side too, he escalated. So he's trying to get as much, he's, he and Washington are corresponding and Hamilton's saying basically, we need to bring military force against some of these people somewhere in the country because this tax is not getting collected anywhere. Anywhere there's so much resistance. And Hamilton wanted a military crackdown. It was, he thought it was critically important to show that the government could do that, that the federal government had that power. And if he didn't show it, nobody would ever believe it. And the, the country wouldn't become unified the way he wanted it to be. The, the Western edges would sort of peel off, and, you know, get taken over by other powers or whatever. He was committed to the idea that we're gonna have to do this somewhere. Washington's telling him, as he often did, like, yeah, yeah, I get it, but we can't do this too fast. It's gotta look like a last resort thing. You know, we've got a lot of opposition to even having a military, you know, like, so this was a dicey bit of politics that went on. Um, but Hamilton is always, always, always trying to raise the stakes. He, he read all the petitions and he wrote a new tax law that made things even worse for the small producers, for example. Uh, he sent a guy out there to, um, to sort of give him a report on what was going on and the guy just stirred up trouble and came back saying the place is already in a state of insurrection, which in one way was kind of not yet true, but in another way, you go back to the, to the 
to the farm, small farmers and landless laborers and the people who are getting more and more angry. Um, well, it really was kind of beginning into a state of insurrection where, where government was powerless. And there was a new kind of different government who wanted a different kind of government. They were more democratic, but the way they were pulling it off was quite, was, was very intimidating and not very democratic. Um, and so you get this almost impossible situation in which, in which both sides are actually eager to bring it to the worst outcome, which would be, of course, a military outcome where the federal government is actually bringing troops against American citizens. Not that it's never happened since. Um, and there are some interesting, there are a lot of interesting resonances to this, but still it's something you would think you'd want to avoid. But actually in this case, both sides really kind of wanted it, wanted it to become what it became. Um, so in the end, you know, there was a shootout. The tax collector, uh, who Hamilton, Washington and Hamilton crony out there, a rich guy who lived on top of a hill, had been, he was a big commercial distiller and he'd been made the tax collector. So he was taking, he's collecting this tax and getting paid for it because you got a percentage of what you collected, except he was finding it very hard to collect the tax, but still that was the setup. And he, at this, at some point he had barricaded his house. I mean, he turned it into a fortified uh, castle really. He was one of the few slave owners out there and he had his enslaved people uh, drilling with weaponry to fight off any attack. And the attack finally did come. It was partly, uh, it was partly instigated by Hamilton sending a federal marshal out to serve writs um, and doing so in such a way that it was operating under an older, stricter part of the law, actually, because one thing he did loosen up, but then he made the writs, he, he pushed the writs into the docket to get them to be served under a stricter law. This enraged people. And finally, you get a shootout. I mean, a true military shootout. And this isn't tarring and feathering or attacking people and individual people. This is an actual military operation by the Risky Rebels. They were formerly revolutionary soldiers um, against, the fed, against federal officers, a federal marshal who was serving the writs and the federal tax collector, who were then expelled from Pittsburgh, sent down the Ohio on a boat, literally banished. So basically there's a sense that there's the US law is not worth anything. So now you can see, I mean, why maybe Washington would feel called upon to raise all these troops. Um, the final part of this story, uh, which I'm going to come to now uh, is shorter than the opening parts. Uh, it's, it's about the crackdown. And it's just another piece of the Hamilton story that's so fascinating because um, Washington decided, Hamilton had already decided it'd be great if Washington personally led these troops. Long before he even knew where he was going to bring this crackdown, he had in his mind the president leading it. He said, that'll really make a point. So this was all in plan. But they had to, uh, they had to raise these troops, and they weren't ready for that. So they engaged in sham negotiations with the rebels to try to come up with a deal for the troops not coming. And the rebels just kind of folded. And the whole area really was just terrified of a federal inv military invasion. And the entire place turned out to sign loyalty oaths that were supposed to put them in an amnesty so they wouldn't get, either, the, either the, the, the federals wouldn't come or they wouldn't be arrested. But, but actually all that was just cover for, for, uh, for building up the military operation. And it was coming no matter what, that was the point. And when they came, um, Washington led the troops, which meant most of the time he rode in the coach because his back had gone out, it wasn't like, always on the white horse up front. They would do that kind of photo op thing where he'd get out and do that, but mostly he rode in the coach. Hamilton by his side the entire time, serving as Secretary of War now, even though he was appointed and confirmed by the Senate, as uh, appointed by Washington, confirmed by the Senate as Secretary of the Treasury. He wasn't really confirmed to be doing this kind of thing, but they, they kind of shuffled Henry Knox, who was Secretary of the Treasury, out of the way. So Hamilton could really run this operation himself. I mean, this is just very Hamilton. Um, Washington turns back at Bedford, PA, kind of at the crest of the, of, the, of the Appalachians there. And then Hamilton and Governor Henry Lee of Virginia come down as hard as it can be imagined on the people, the whole populace of five counties of Western Pennsylvania. I don't like to say really um, they suppressed the Whiskey Rebellion. They suppressed the populace of Western Pennsylvania with, I mean, warrantless mass searches and seizures, uh, they broke most of the rules of the, of, the, of the Bill of Rights, which had recently been created. It's a brand new constitution. They held det people in detention with, with, uh, with, with no indefinitely, with no, with no charge. Um, 
the point was not really to suppress a rebellion which had disintegrated by that time. The point was to make the point that the federal government has this power and it's gonna use it. Um, and so it's not an edifying story uh, really, really at any point point, although it can be quite, parts of it are quite exciting. But the, uh, the, the suppression of the five counties was, had nothing to do with really, I mean, everybody had to sign a loyalty oath now, again. And these were, these were loyalty oaths delivered to doors by, you know, dragoons, um, and, you know, you sign. And so, and then was an occupation, military occupation that, that went on well into 1795 and probably longer, I can't really remember. Uh, there was almost no evidence against most of the people arrested. And Washington and Hamilton knew this. You can read their correspondence and talk about how they're, they're picking examples. People would be good examples, even though they didn't really have any evidence. People came back to, they were brought back to Philadelphia. They were put on trial. Some of them hadn't even been charged, you know, before they were marched over the mountains in the freezing cold and thrown in jail. And uh, they got almost no convictions because there really wasn't much evidence against the people who were, who were, uh, who were arrested. And so the, that's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of coming to the conclusion here. There's a lot of nuance we could fill in and maybe in the Q&A something will come up where I'll, I'll fill in some other stuff. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of action. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of things in which like, as Laura was talking about, like good guys and bad guys, you know, like um, both sides, you can see why they're doing what they're doing. And yet they're making some big, big moves that are gonna lead to a kind of a disaster. And yet for Hamilton, and I guess I'll close uh, on sort of considering this, this, this issue. For Hamilton, it was by no means a disaster. Um, it was a great success. And he resigned his, his position actually uh, after the Whiskey Rebellion had been suppressed or after the five counties of Western Pennsylvania, the people had been suppressed there. And he felt very much that he had succeeded in his original idea, which was always, he always called democracy, you know, the worst poison, the American poison. He had succeeded really in, in at least showing that there was potential to bring about the kind of government and the kind of a private partner, private public partnership among elites and government that he had had in mind and that it could be enforced and that the government was not, not going to lie down and roll over when people, uh, when people uh, rebelled against uh, the federal government. So he felt this was a great success. And in some ways I think he was right because it was a great success for his vision of America. He wrote a letter to uh, his uh, sister-in-law, Angelica Church, uh, who's also become famous because of the play, um, with whom he did have this very kind of, you know, a side of him came out in, in his relationship to her. They had a kind of flirtatious and fun relationship. And he wrote her a kind of one of this joie de vivre kind of letters about how basically, oh, our, our, risk, our whiskey rebellion has, 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 has just it's come off, you know, it's come off really well. He's just like, it's, it's put the country on a good footing. And he doesn't say the suppression of the, of the rebellion. It's so interesting. He says the rebellion. It's like the rebellion put the country on a good footing. And in a way, I think he was maybe semi-consciously or unconsciously telling the absolute truth there. I think he really wanted there to be this kind of intense conflict and that then uh, his points would be made about power and money. So that's kind of a quick uh, trip through some of the main points of the Whiskey Rebellion. And uh, we're gonna have a Q&A, I guess, so maybe we can talk about some of the finer points or talk about why we don't, uh, why we don't think of it as, as important as Hamilton did. Since, we, since we, now we care about Hamilton, it would be good to look at what he thought it was important as maybe important, even if we don't look at it all from his point of view. So that's my pitch on the Whiskey Rebellion. And um, before I, uh, turn this back over. I'm just going to toast all of you for coming out here <laughs> with a small shot of the fair product itself. And I don't, uh, you probably can't see this, but it actually says the Whiskey Rebellion on this glass, on the shot glass. And on the back is the publication date of my, of the book. Because when I, it was my first book, it was very exciting. And we had a big uh, publication party and we made some shot glasses uh, up to give away. And so I still have one of them. So uh, cheers. And before I even forget, before we get into the q and I'll forget to say what I, also what I wanted to say, which is uh, thank you so much to NYCH2O. And thank you to Interboro for uh, having me to this uh, unusual, but really, really fun event. And uh, cheers. Cheers. Thank you, Bill, for a, a super fascinating talk.
I, I, I didn't understand the context, um, but it makes a lot of sense that it was, it was really driven by nation building and, and concentrating uh, economic power and, um, and, and, and that um, partnership, like you said, between the, the ruling class and the government it was, was fundamental to, uh, to our founding. And I, I, di I, didn't, I didn't know all that. Um, and somebody asked that question. Um, uh, Kevin asks, uh, given the circumstances at the time, do you think the United States could have been founded on a more egalitarian model like what the rebels wanted if a nation is dependent on a concentration of economic and military power? That's the uh, million dollar question, Kevin. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. It was the 18th century. There was definitely a strong, you know, sense of what nationhood really meant. The the alternatives to say the Hamiltonian vision that were in the elites, where where there was power to create a new kind of government. Um, you know, there was also the sort of there were the state sovereignty people who didn't really want a national government, right? Um, these are these are also these are Hamilton's fellow members of the elite, but they're taking a completely different position. They don't really want to be part of a national government. They fought the Constitution pretty hard. Um, I don't see, I don't think, here's the interesting thing. A lot of the whiskey rebels, the people who became whiskey rebels, they were not like that. They were not anti-federalists necessarily who just wanted Pennsylvania to be its own thing. They were a weird mix of a kind of secessionist idea. They wanted the whole Western part of the country to, to, to secede and be its own thing, some of them. Some of them just wanted a national government that looked out for the average person. And by the average person, before we romanticize these people again too much, they meant, you know, white men. So let's not overstate their democratic uh, tendencies. But they did want a a national, some of them wanted a national government that would ha level the playing field, level the playing field. That's what they'd always wanted. That's why they fought the revolution. And they thought that's what they were fighting it for. Could that have come about um, becomes just a really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something to kick around forever and I'll never have an answer to that. Um, certainly one example that's not well known is the government of Pennsylvania itself for a time became very egalitarian compared to any other government ever, probably ever before. They gave unpropertied white men the vote, for example, um, and did, so there, there were models, there were models. Uh, and so it is possible there could have been another model. The most popular, the most famous model would be the anti-federalist model where it was just the state elites would have been in charge instead of the federal elite or whatever. Um, and I don't think that's much of an alternative, but there were some models. Uh, Thomas Paine had a vision for how the country could run that was very different from Hamilton's or from the anti-federalist. And Herman Husband, who I haven't gotten a chance to talk about, one of the most interesting thinkers hovering around the Whiskey Rebellion, also had a vision for an, a, a nation, but one that was dedicated to a kind of an egalitarian society. So it was, I would never say it was impossible. Um, it would have been very unusual and very kind of exciting at the time if it had happened, but there were many powers arrayed against it. Uh, uh, Howard, uh, excuse me. Um, uh, uh, another Ken asks, was there a particular ethnic group distilling whiskey at the time? I think you probably answered that question, but um, it's- I don't, I don't think I talked about it actually. Um, there, there is the Scots-Irish piece of this. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's an idea and partly true um, that, you know, the, the, the techniques and the, and the ability to really make great whiskey. I mean, there were a lot of Scots-Irish people who, had, who, had, who, were, who were settling out there. Um, and so a lot of those, of, of the real art, art, artistry to it uh, may have come partly from, from them. But it's funny, so, so, so yeah, as distillers maybe, but uh, so maybe that's a Scotch Irish thing. But um, I, can't, I went into my research on the Whiskey Rebellion thinking it was basically a Scots Irish type of uprising. You know, there's a kind of a, a mythos about the Scots Irish, like born fighting. That's Senator Jim Webb's uh, book, The Virginian's book about his Scots Irish ancestry. Like they're just a rebellious people and they're tough and they're independent, all of which is likely to be true. Um, but when I actually got into, sorry. When I actually got into the Whiskey Rebellion, I found that the ethnic makeup of the rebels themselves simply did not conform to any 
uh, obvious pattern around Scots Irish. I mean, there were Germans, uh, people of German descent, who were very, very key in the in the in the in the rebellion itself, and also, you know, people with just straight English backgrounds and and so forth. So, I, I'm not. When it comes to the distilling, uh, there are probably people who know more about that than I do. When it comes to the rebellion, I would not say that it broke down along. I really think it was a class more. You know, if you're going to pick ethnic determinism, class determinism, I'm going to say it was class deterministic more than ethnic deterministic. Got it. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, it's worth noting that uh, there, uh, Neil is a former ATF agent and um, uh, worked in Pittsburgh. Um, excuse me. Uh, right, worked in Pittsburgh, and um, uh, he said he makes the point that uh, ATF is a direct heir to Washington's force. And um, interesting, that's an interesting way to look at. Yeah, talk and make sense. I mean, you know, we still we pay excise taxes now, right? I mean, and uh, yeah, and it's so interesting that it's alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. That's all I've always found that interesting. When Hamilton first was pitching this. The, uh, the, the whiskey tax to Congress. One of the things he tried to do was kind of get, get them into a health, a health thing. Um, you know, he didn't really, I don't think he cared that much about the health issues around drinking whiskey, but he brought in uh, doctors from the Philadelphia College of Medicine to sort of tell the congressman how the tax would, would inhibit and disincentivize too much whiskey drinking, um, which is just, it's just an interesting idea of the role of, go the role of government I mean, there were, there were congressmen in the first Congress listening to Hamilton just going, what? Like, government is going to tell people what to drink and eat? This is just, or, you know, or they wouldn't, they wouldn't have even imagined smoke, or that stuff's going to be regulated like that? Like, are you crazy? That's not what we're here. That's not what we're here for. They were, they were a libertarian bunch, a lot of them. But it is very interesting how very early in the vision of the country on the parts of some people, you know, major regulation... Uh, of, well, alcohol, tobacco is like vice, you know. Um, I've always been interested in how firearms get rolled into that particular one. But also just because Pittsburgh came up, um, one of the great, uh, the great benefits to me of having researched this and written this book, um, and I've been back many, many times both to talk about it there and to do other research on tangentially related projects, is that it got me connected to Pittsburgh in a way that I'm a New Yorker, like lifelong. Um, and I don't know that many other New Yorkers who have the connection the Pittsburgh I have and to that whole area. And I just, you know, just because we're talking about it, I just like love Pittsburgh. That's all I can say. It's a great town. Um, uh, there's a lot of good questions. I'm just going to jump around a little bit. Laura asks, um, my understanding is that many of the distillers um, of that time moved to Kentucky and Tennessee after this, still trying to avoid uh, paying the taxes. Do you, uh, do you care to comment? There's controversy around that in whiskey circles, in whiskey history circles, I believe. I mean, I think it's, it's something I've said and I've seen, myself, I've seen myself somewhat taken to task online for having said it by people who know more about that history than I do. There's certainly a, a tradition that, you know, as, as Kentucky had opened up and actually become a state, um, that there was a certain flight of whiskey rebel types to Kentucky. So you take that, that rebellious thing and that whiskey thing you know, just into a more remote place. Um, I think there's got to be some truth to that. I mean, people were people were starting to move west, and Kentucky was absolutely one of the places where people were moving anyway, and where you would go if you would thought maybe you could get a little farther away from what you considered government harassment. So I think there's some truth to it. I can't, as a as a whiskey taster and as a whiskey a student of whiskey history, I can't draw a line exactly between, like, say, bourbon, which we associate with Kentucky. I mean, now, now we make bourbon all over the place, happily, but uh, there was a time when it was basically Kentucky. I can't draw a, a perfect, uh, a perfect line there. I don't have the knowledge to do that. Uh, somebody, thank you. Somebody just uh, commented, I think this is timely and, and, um, and worth pointing out. Uh, Sam says, I think we'll, we'll, I think we see echoes of this issue in the current legalization of marijuana uh, 
specifically local small producers versus big corporate producers. And I, I, I've heard talks about that. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very real issue. And I guess one that has been um, uh, um, part of our history for a long time. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, and I'm not super expert on uh, the current things around, about, around marijuana, but I have been watching that because of my interest in this sort of kind of regulation and the, the way government gets connected. When you legalize something, you know, instead of decriminalizing it, but actually to legalize it. Well, there's a huge opportunity, of course, for government to uh, benefit from revenue because now you have a tax, they have a whole tax thing going on, uh, just, just, you know, somewhat like the whiskey tax kind of situation. Uh, states need revenue. And you get this sort of weird relationship between, I mean, what, what, kind of, 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 what kind of business is government going to be likely to want to encourage? It's a matter of policy, really. Hamilton's idea was to encourage the big. Um, you know, he had reasons for that, which he could spell out for you. He wasn't trying to hide it. Is this what we want to encourage now? Uh, you know, I don't know, but the corporate power is so, is so powerful now that, uh, and the people in government may be so beholden to corporate power and to the, even to the, just the idea of corporate power and consolidation that uh, we may think it may just be kind of taken for granted that it'd be good policy to, to encourage the bigger producers. There's some, there's some pushback against that right now. I mean, you know, I didn't get into this in the talk, but I mean, part of Hamilton's thing was, was uh, I said cartel. I mean, there was a certain amount of monopolization going on uh, that he wanted to encourage. He wanted to in, in consolidate. And right now, for the first time in a long time, uh, we're seeing significant pushback on, in policy circles against, and in, and in political circles against, uh, you know, I mean, even across parties. Uh, against uh, con uh, industry consolidation and monopolization. So I don't, I don't know what's going to happen with marijuana, but I do think it's a really interesting echo of the Whiskey Rebellion and, and, that, and that the Whiskey Rebellion interestingly echoes what's going on now. Interesting. Um, there are a lot of good questions. Uh, I just, let me... Uh, somebody asked early on, um, uh, was, in, in, and you, you sort of answered the question, but I, I, I think it's worth asking again because of your discussion about um, uh, the controversy with um, the federal government telling people, you know, what they could drink or what they can't drink. Was the whiskey tax meant in some way to be a sin tax? Yeah, I mean, that, Hamilton pitched it that way to Congress. That's, that's part of the, so yes, in a way it was. And it was considered, okay, here's the thing. He said, he, he put it this way. I mean, he didn't, wouldn't have used the word sin, the, the syntax in this sense, but still, he pitched it this way. And uh, I'm glad I get to answer this because I, I kind of glossed over it when I was talking before. He's like, it's, you know, look, it's, a, it's, a, it's an innocuous tax. There's no downside. All of the things I was talking about, about the real downsides that he really deliberately built into it, downsides for the small producer. He was like, it's an innocuous tax. It's value neutral in a way because it's a tax on a luxury product, right? Putting it that way, more, more, less like it's a sin tax. Although he did bring those doctors in and scandalize some of the congressmen by trying to talk about it as the health issue, like a federal health, health issue. Um, but... Um, he also pitched it as, you know, it's, 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 it's fine. It's not going to hurt anybody because what happens? The, uh, it's, it's collected at the point of production. Um, and the consumer, you know, the, uh, the producer just passes that tax on to the consumer on a, on a luxury item in the form of a higher price. And it's just fascinating to think about how basically fundamentally untrue that was regarding whiskey in America, especially in the West. And the fact that on the one hand, yes, of course, he's right. The producer is going to have to pass that on to the consumer in the form of a higher price. And he'd structured the tax so that big producers were paying fractions of the tax that smaller producers were paying. And so this is just another accelerator for driving the small producer out of business because they were going to have to raise their price. Whereas the big, as often happens with volume, the big producers are going to be able to lower their price. That was, he didn't mention that to Congress, but that's part of the pitch. And there's another way in which, of course, for Western small farmers and artisanal producers and seasonal producers, 
it, it, it was a, yes, the, the, for the consumer, it's a luxury item. But for the producer, those producers, it was an absolute, like just clinging by the skin of their, skin of their teeth, by their fingernails to a cliff edge. This was the only uh, cash product they could create because they could reduce huge amounts of, of rye, which would cost a lot of money to ship over the mountains to the east, to the form of a small product, which much, much cheaper to ship. I mean, I have statistics about how many mules it would take to ship the rye versus the, versus the, the, uh, the, the whiskey, which I can't remember right now, but like an incredible reduction in cost for an incredible raise in, in, in value because whiskey was very, very popular in the East, uh, especially old Monongahela rye. So um, he, he was not being, he was disingenuous, let's just put it that way, when he, when he presented it this way. And I think this does connect a little bit with the syntax idea. Like cigarettes these days are, you know, prohibitively expensive because of the taxation in certain places, certain states, um, and this is supposed to disincentivize smoking. Um, you know, I don't know the way I see it. It also has a a, a pretty regressive effect because the, uh, the 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 cost revenue to the state is being borne by, as I think we can generally see, most of the people who buy cigarettes are less well off. Um, so it's, it's so, so the syntax and the regressive aspect of it kind of get combined in an interesting way as well. Interesting. Um, John asks, what corporate producers were the winners in the struggle? Do any of them still exist today? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. So post whiskey rebellion. Um, yeah. I don't know that any of the producers who were producing during it exist today. I think there've been some, there's been some, I, and I can, I'm happy to be corrected on this. I'd love to know otherwise. Um, the, uh, I think some have, have gone back and, and uh, kind of done some kind of, I don't know, retro branding around Whiskey Rebellion stuff. Um, but um, yeah, uh, big producers did prosper for sure uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, the, uh, old Overholt, for example, I believe this, this did not, the old Overholt ride did not exist during the whiskey rebellion. I'm pretty sure. Um, but it was a big, big producer that benefited mightily from, uh, from the consolidation of the industry. And it, it, it was the rye. It was like the only rye. Like when I was younger, there was only, when rye wasn't hip, the rye was this kind of like thing from the past to me there was like one brand of rye on every bar and it was covered with dust and it was old overhauled i mean and some years before that everybody drank rye in highballs or whatever and old overhaul was, was was a was a big producer um i will also note though that george washington started producing whiskey at mount vernon after he suppressed the whiskey rebellion um uh, and did it, 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 and did so. He took advantage of the uh, of the tax as well, and personally benefited from the suppression of the whiskey rebellion in that way. And also, he was a speculator in Western land, uh, uh, and his Western land portfolio went up in value about fifty percent after the whiskey rebellion was suppressed as well. So I've, I've focused on Hamilton, but Washington's Washington's played a huge role in that suppression, of course. And he himself was a distiller after the Whiskey Rebellion was suppressed. Interesting. Yes, yeah, so somebody asked uh, those, those, those specific questions and so you already answered them. That's great. Um, uh, so somebody asks about uh, Herman Husband. Did any of Her Herman Husband's followers continue promoting his beliefs or did that movement die with him? after he was released by pri from prison. Okay, right, this refers to a, a character in the book who's not really just a character in the book, but a real person in the, who was, I mentioned very briefly. He had very, very advanced uh, ideas about what, what a national government could do um, that were super egalitarian, but also very focused on national administration. I feel that his ideas died for a long time after he, he was the first person arrested uh, in the crackdown. He was already really old. He was, he was marched across the mountains uh, and thrown in prison where he awaited trial for a long, long time. And prison, the Philadelphia prison, 
was not a healthy environment. He was a he was acquitted. He was acquitted. And then he was released to go home. Okay, we don't want you anymore. We don't need you anymore. Head home. He died on his way uh, home, uh, having caught pneumonia, I believe, in prison. And he had he was he was a true visionary. He had a religious and a socialist vision that were combined in one of what America could be. And it was not an anti-federalist vision. It was a vision of a nation state organized along principles that, I mean, literally, I don't think husband's ideas came back and no one acknowledges husband at all today, really. The left doesn't acknowledge him. Uh, we never hear about him. Um, I don't think his principles came back really until we begin to get things like, you know, late 19th century, like a really assertive labor movement, um, maybe some of Brian's stuff, anti-monopoly and anti-gold standard. And I don't think his ideas come to fruition until the New Deal. That's how visionary he was. Um, so the sad answer to the question is, is I think to a great extent, his, his ideas seemed at the time anyway to, to die with him. And nobody talks about him anymore, even though he envisioned something like social security uh, back in the 18th century, he had a vision of something like social security, for example. So people thought he was crazy, you know, because if you can envision social security in the 1780s, you, maybe you are. But he, I think he should be. Uh, I think he should be remembered, and uh, I'm working on that now in a new book. So we'll see what happens. Oh, that's awesome. Um, all right. So so maybe we'll do uh, two more questions. And um, uh, thank you again for s such a, um, a fascinating talk and Q and A, and 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 thank you to to Laura um, for everything. Uh, and and I and I want to say if we did not answer your question. Um, please email us and we will forward it to Bill and, and get your question answered. All right, so two more, let me, let me take a look. Somebody at Hardy asks, uh, isn't the Whiskey Rebellion, the Marbury versus Mad Madison, the government's right to tax? Uh, well, yeah, in a way, I guess you could say that. I mean, it, 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 it made plain the government, you know, in the Constitution, the government has the power, the federal government has the power to tax. Um, excises, direct tax, you know, it has that power. Um, and that was critical to the constitution because the people who wanted the constitution wanted those public creditors, who I was talking about, the bondholders, to get paid their interest. To the point where, you know, George Washington said, if they try to amend that aspect of it out, it'll just be useless. We gotta have that. That's how important that power to tax was. Um, and in this event, this violent event, violence on both sides, and this crackdown, you know, unconstitutional crackdown on people, I would say it was proven, you know, the power existed on paper. It was proven that the government has the power to tax, um, not just theoretically, but in fact. And if, and like any law, you know, if you break it, there's going to be a penalty and you're not going to be able to rise up as a group in this, in this country and break away and just decide, oh, these five counties of Western Pennsylvania are not paying that tax. That's just not going to happen. So in that sense, it was a, a kind of a, to me, it's kind of a watershed moment in which the federal government's power to have its will adhered to was made plain. It's terribly fraught because of course, the way they did that in the end, A, Hamilton instigated and escalated because he wanted a violent outcome. And then the violent outcome itself was so fraught with illegality. Um, so, that's, you know, I just have to leave it there. I mean, yes, the federal government established its sovereignty in many ways through the suppression of the Whiskey Rebellion. And we're left with a kind of a mixed story on, on that. Beautiful. I think that's a good place to leave it. Um, I, there are some, some other uh, questions, but we will um, uh, make sure that we get your questions answered. And the, the email to, e to reach us at is, um, you can just respond to, to our follow-up email that's coming to you. And um, in that follow-up email,
uh, will be uh, a reminder that you can bid on the whiskey tasting at Interboro that's coming up in June and July. Um, th there'll be a few dates. So um, if you do get the winning bid, um, you will uh, definitely be able to attend. And um, so I, with that, um, I want to thank Bill for, for such a fascinating talk. Um, I, 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 it's inspiring, you know, knowing that there are all these connections. And um, so thanks for, for making them uh, for us. And thanks uh, to Laura for, um, for also uh, being co-host with us and um, for always so graciously hosting us on um, our brewery tours and for um, introducing Bill and for um, donating those whiskey uh, tasting tickets. So thank you for, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank and you. Lana for making everything run smooth as usual. So, um, so thanks again, everybody for attending. Uh, you'll be hearing from us soon. And um, we look forward to, to another program with you soon. Check out our website. Good night. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.